Uh, our next speaker is Sean Patton, owner of Stock Survey Environmental Consulting on Native Plants, Native Fish, and Native uh, Florida. And as you all probably are observing, our ponds, our stormwater ponds and lakes are really looking horrible. There you get a bunch of this green stuff that's growing there and uh, the smell is not so good and I think most of it's coming from our, our lawns. But it's a, these ponds could be just really wonderful places for us. And in some of the larger ponds, I was kind of hoping that we would get people put a little islands in them because the, the birds would like to, to uh, use them to uh, re uh, reproduce and to nest in. So um, he, Sean is, was, uh, is highly recommended by the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. They told me, if you want to get a great speaker, have Sean come to your place. So I, so I took advantage of their recommendations. He's a graduate of New College, Florida, in marine biology and ecology, and is an aquatic biologist working in swamps, lakes, and other bodies of water. He helps run the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project, helping document and identify plants in these counties and engaged in public citizen science. After being disillusioned by the traditional costly, impermanent, and ineffective systems within the private environmental management sectors, he began researching on alternative methods for restoring Florida landscapes to their most balanced and natural forms. Let's learn how he utilizes these naturally occurring biological stations, native plants, and harvesting, and a coalition of green businesses to restore habitat across our state. He believes, as, as I think all of us here probably, believes that backyards can be a flourishing habitat and every pond a paradise. I think we could even almost consider making a national park in some of our lawns. Thank you very much for coming, appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. Oh, and during the break, go out there and get some native plants from Tim and Anna. I hope you, this is a great opportunity to get some great plants, thanks. All right, thank you everyone for having me. It was only this short three hour drive from Sarasota where I'm located. <laughs> And I will be sure to leaf you all with so much good information that you can restore habitat all over Vero Beach. And this island is actually one that we've been maintaining and growing for several years. And by harvesting and removing the plants on it every once in a while, we can actually, because the roots are still below the island, we can actually remove nutrients before they hit the bays. We can prevent red tide doing projects like this. And I'm also proud to announce that um, as of November 2022, and we're announcing it this year, we have restored over 1 million plants and animals back into the environment all across the state of Florida. And we are doing projects on a scale that can help stop red tide and climate change. We're reversing this. We fixed the hole in the ozone layer. We can do this too. And I know a lot of presentations about the environment tend to be very negative, but I have an eeling you all will get some good stuff out of this one. What's well, the goal of this presentation besides seeing a weird man in khaki dance on stage? Well, the goal is to get native plants, healthy lakes, wetlands, and landscape ecosystems. Um, Florida actually has 14 different ecosystems and over 2,000 plants native to the state. Over 400 are only found in the state of Florida, and we are discovering more all the time. And in fact, I found a new species of grass potentially just the other month but grass is horrible to identify, so I don't know what to call it yet. So whenever you're talking about a shoreline, how many of you have seen those shorelines where it's just a grass, 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 and then like a three foot drop off and half your yard erodes away and your pond is just falling into it? And we'll have some time for questions at the end or you can meet me at the stocking savvy booth. Um, well, that doesn't exist in nature in Florida. We're a very flat state. Kansas is probably the only state flatter than we are. And what we need to do is when we're looking at a lot of our ponds and lakes and wetlands is we need to have these gentle slopes. And there's four main zones. The upland zone, that's where we live. I don't know about you all, but I don't like waking up and my socks are soggy. I like to have at least a dry house. And so we usually build in the uplands. Then you have the riparian zone. This is um, right where the high water mark and a lot of the flooding tends to come up and down. 
And this is um, one of the most important zones for butterfly gardens. And we have actually written a book we are going to be publishing sometime soon um, on aquatic butterfly gardens and how to turn all these habitats into butterfly gardens. And we're going to be um, going into that a little bit in this presentation. Then you have emergent. These are underwater most of the year, except for in the middle of winter, the lo lowest water seasons. This is where you get a lot of like spike rushes, pickerel weeds. And then you also have the littoral. This is the deepest areas, spatter dock, American lotus, and other things. Most shorelines go straight from upland to littoral, or straight from upland to deep emergent. All of this right here, a lot of the hibiscuses, the spider lilies, the canna lilies, all the most beautiful plants that live in Florida, you can't grow around that. And you also are losing your backyard, you're losing your property values, and because you're mowing right to the edge, there's no filter, and all those nutrients are going out and making the other speakers very upset. I just saw, I just saw a whole presentation on grass, so we don't want to make him mad. And oh, this is a full sun example. This is a shade example. And we actually have started doing epiphyte restoration as well. And that helps to increase humidity, provide more biodiversity, attract more birds. And a lot of these air plants actually even store water to act as bird drinking fountains and to help keep the area more humid, which helps keep more water in your ponds. In these shady ponds, we have a lot of live oaks over. And live oaks and cypresses are great. Their roots really help hold in the bank. Um, you could get things like lizard's tail, blue flag, iris, wild coffee. And oh, gee, if only we had someone here today, maybe a native plant nursery, who was carrying some of these plants. You might want to check outside after the presentation for them. But you want to have everything planted. And notice how in none of these, there's grass. Unless you're having a lot of tall or large clumping grasses, none of this should be mowed unless it's the most shallow of inclines. And then you can get some of these ground cover ecosystems. I actually have some clients um, in Orlando in a community called Avalon Park where they have extremely shallow sandy banks going into these um, ponds and the banks are maintained um, very short and this has allowed because it's so shallow and acidic that some of the native carnivorous plants have popped up and they have fields of sundew and we'll look at a few of those later. So this is your standard shoreline Garbage. Look, they're losing all their yard, their lake's filling in, and as lakes get shallower, you're going to get more and more algae. Algae is bad. Um, in a lot of these lakes, we have way too much of it. We want to look at fish and birds and flowers. There's none of that in there. So I send my employees. I always make sure I have at least one employee shorter than me so that they can be fed to the gators and I'm safe. And don't worry, because we have workers comp. We'll be fine. Um, to go in and they help and I do the most important job which is supervising. I'm a good manager. I watch where I can be dry and on my phone. And bang. after we did this, this lake stopped having algae blooms. They haven't had an algae bloom since we did this. Water lilies, spatter dock, and American lotus, those floating water lilies get some giant flowers and they're great at shading out the algae. They've started to rebuild some of their bank and you can see that we have purple flowers. We have white and yellow flowers. We have um, blue and yellow flowers. There's all sorts of flowers and stuff around this bank. And we're even starting to replace no-mo zones with native plant borders, especially new developments where we can get away with it. Um, because once you put in this grass and you get a lot of invasive weeds and stuff with it, then you start to become more and more dependent on chemical herbicides. And I am a lazy millennial. I don't like mowing. I don't want to spray. So let's make these low maintenance native ecosystems that look better. Because that, especially when there are algae blooms, um, this would have a seasonal algae blooms every summer where we would get um, blue-green algae and a lot of just noxious smells. We don't have that anymore. We're getting more birds. Sandhill cranes nested for the first time on the shoreline of this lake a year after we did this project. And wetland plants grow a lot faster than most trees and most of your landscape plants. You will get flowers within three to six months. You can start repairing these ecosystems to be and look like healthy wetlands in as little as two years to really solidify. Oh, you also have a lot of these drainage ecosystems and a lot of these are you know, invasive grasses um, or sometimes it's just a lot of erosion and muck. That looks like garbage. No. We want healthy wetlands. That's Kendall, one of my employees. Um, if you email me, She's probably the one checking the email. She's much nicer than I am. You want her to be there. Um, and you see all these big rushes in wetlands. 
We can have wetlands that look like this, and this is really good for bird habitat. But we can also do things like butterfly gardens, where we replace a lot of the ground cover with bacopa. Um, we have a lot of young hibiscuses and pickerel weeds popping up. Golden canna lilies are one of my favorites. And we're constantly putting out more and more um, example photos. These are some of our, our earliest sites. Um, then we also have other wetlands. So this is that island a few months later. You can see it's really growing in. We're getting a lot of flowers um, and the ground covers especially. We've had three different um, generations of ducks on this island. We've had a generation of gallinules, and we also had a very fat snapping turtle. It really surprised us. Um, and tons of animals use this island um, for habitat. And if you live in an area where you don't have a lake, but you really like these plants, including like the blue flag iris or the white milkweed, just put in a pot with no drainage. That's it. Just plug up the holes, and then you can have a wetland pot, and you can attract some of these wetland species. Most of Florida used to be covered in little pockets of depression marshes and things, and a lot of these wetland species and butterflies would go from pocket to pocket, and you can still replicate that in your yard. Um, I do always like to make a quick, brief mention, especially living on the coast, which most Floridians do. Even on the coast, we have tons of drought-tolerant plants. Everything from large trees like sea grapes and strangler figs to beautiful things like the railroad vine to and Jamaican capers, a nice medium-sized um, salt-tolerant bush. Beautiful flowers. Many of these are also butterfly host plants. And then, of course, sea oats. If you like oatmeal, you'll love sea oats. They're the biggest oats I've ever seen. And then, of course, we have some nice epiphyte oat um, restoration. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say everyone likes native plants and habitat restoration. Could say we're trying to transform some landscapes. Well, this is one that most people don't even think about. And this actually provides a lot more humidity. You water even less in these ecosystems. And old growth forests produce most of their own rain. Um, we have already done several air plant restorations. We've done several resurrection fern restoration, restorations. I'm actually a guest professor at Ringling College of art and design, and we're working on doing some epiphyte mountings where we're going to be helping to figure out how can we make this look more artistic? What can we do? And um, we are even looking into getting native orchids captive grown, because it's much easier to grow orchids in captivity than poach them, and don't poach wild orchids, it's a problem, and then bring them to your trees. So that way we get all the beautiful um, organisms that come with them. Florida has so many different ecosystems. This is um, Carlson Preserve, a beautiful, beautiful site. Um, it burns fairly regularly. Don't light your yards on fire. Please don't. Mowing can suffice. I had one client light their yard on fire because I talked about fire ecology. So now I have to say it every presentation. Pick an ecosystem and mimic it. All of these plants are to some extent in um, cultivation. And the more native plants you buy, the more readily available a lot of these are going to be. Chaff heads and blazing stars are gorgeous purple flowers. A lot of the seasonal flowers and bloomers are what really a lot of these insects rely on, like this giant, I think it's a kind of bombardier beetle. Or long, oh, it's a longhorn beetle. Um, we also have many of our native pines, sand pines and sand hill of communities, which are these dry, sandy areas, especially in central Florida, are some of the areas most in decline. Um, and so we want to help restore all those ecosystems. And many of these drought ecosystems still have lakes and ponds and wetlands nearby. Because again, we're doing control of the water. And so we want to make sure we're restoring those right too. Um, seaside gentian recently hit the uh, native plant trade this year in some areas. That's gorgeous. Why are we going to Walmart and buying something that lasts three months and looks like garbage? That's cute. That's cool. Why are we buying plants from all over the world that need tons of fertilizer, tons of maintenance, tons of pesticides, and why are we going all the way to Africa, South America, Asia, or God forbid, New York for these plants when we can get some amazing Florida natives? And again, we have over 400 plants found nowhere else on Earth. Um, there's one plant that I work with, the Minnesota pawpaw, that used to only be native to Sarasota Manatee counties. And now it's only native to Manatee County due to overdevelopment and a lack of native plants. That's one county. And we have dozens of plants in that state and some that are only native to a few counties. Why are we planting, if I see one more oleander bush, <laughs> I will scream. You could say I'm olive over these native plants, including our native scrub olive. All right. What should you do? We've talked about why you should do it and what the befores and afters look like, but how do you actually do it? Well, 
you want as shallow a slope as you can. So like um, the areas where it's the steeper slope, you have more erosion and less plants. In the really shallow areas, it tends to look better. You also generally, if you're doing these retention ponds, you want to have a deep central pool. This is a good different habitat for fish. And also having everything as either plants or deep water really discourages algae growth. If you don't have plants and it's not deep water, you will have algae. That is not a, like that's a, that's a, that's going to happen because if you don't have the plants that you want, you're going to have something growing there that you then have to kill. Nobody plants near outfalls. Let's please not flood neighborhoods. Um, there's plenty of ways to do this, and there's plenty of other options. And you also want a diversity of native plants. You also want to make sure that you're regularly maintaining this. And we uh, at Stocking Savvy actually do a lot of harvesting. We do a lot of um, preventative measures. We are actually the first company to stock algae-eating native fish um, that can help prevent algae blooms long term. They also produce more bass, more birds. You know, it helps the environment. And in retention ponds, well, with the exception of the walking catfish, most fish can't crawl on land. So how do they get to these detention ponds and retention ponds? Well, they don't. Um, so people put them in there. And so people move things like tilapia or sailfin catfish, which are invasive and actually hurt native fish stocks and hurt bass fishing. So only use natives, native plants, native animals. And in fact, most of the 10 most invasive species, including pretty much almost all of the federally banned plants, are either wetland or aquatic plants. Water hyacinth, the reason we invented herbicides and almost moved 800 hippos to the US and released them into the South, yeah, that was a Senate bill in the, previously, it lost by one boat. We almost had hundreds of wild hippos throughout Louisiana, Florida, and Georgia. Look up the American Hippo Act. Now, I know doctors take a Hippocratic oath and I hope it's not the same. Other than the bad joke at the end that's actually all true, that's how bad these are. We invented Agent Orange, not for war, but for invasive weeds, and they cost 5% of the world economy a year. I want to make money and eventually retire so I can just take photos of cute frogs. Let me retire. Stop planting invasives. Challenges for aquatic gardening. The depth of the water, obviously, if you have a 30-foot deep pond, not many things will grow at the bottom of that. So make sure that you are always planting shallower than you think you need to and let the plants grow in deeper. We also have seasons and a lot of the times that ebb and flow is really important for plants, but you can always start shallower and let them grow deeper. Water clarity. How many of you like looking at a murky greenish goo in your pond? How many of you like looking at nice clear water where you can see all the fish and birds? Yeah. And so by having more of these plants and especially some of the aquatic plants that we stock like um, Cara, Hornwort, um, Ludwigias, Bacopas, these underwater, truly underwater plants, you could have meadows underwater. And I wish I had added some of the presentation, but we actually saw a really good site yesterday where the entire shoreline underwater was just this beautiful meadow. And so we have a newsletter where we put out a lot of these pictures and sites so you can see them. Um, another big issue that we have is actually the native cooter turtles. So a lot of people are like, well, I want to do a test run. So I have a one acre lake and I'm going to put like 20 plants in a little spot and it's going to look nice, right? No, actually. When you're doing a lot of these big restoration projects, especially in large lakes, if you just do a little spot, well, there's a lot of these turtles that are traveling from pond to pond looking for native plants because that's what they eat. And you put 20 native plants in a pond that has 100 turtles and that guy can eat one or two plants by himself, you're going to run out of plants in a week. So what I do is you plant the whole shoreline. You'll lose a few, but a lot of these aquatic plants are fast enough growing that you can get them started. You actually want to do bigger projects so you have a less of a failure rate. Um, obviously, algae and aquatic weeds can be an issue, so you want to manage those. There are a lot of non-herbicide ways to manage algae. Algae is native. There's tons of fish and animals that eat it. Um, aerators can help. Water lilies shade it out. Um, if you have algae issues, you're doing something wrong. Um, or you're way over fertilizing or something. And actually, if you do think you need to fertilize your lawn and you're using water from the pond or like reclaimed water, chances are you don't need to because that water, if it's having algae issues or you're using water from the lake, it's got nutrients in it. We're, we have eutrophic waters, it's high nutrient waters. Why are you wasting fertilizer on your grass that then flows into the pond, causes an algae bloom, you spray to kill it again, and then you're spraying that same nutrients back up north. It's all about controlling the nutrients. 
any of you have ever been on a diet, sometimes you got to eat less and exercise, not just, you know, exercise until you die. Water quality is important. We've talked a lot about that. And just keep checking on your ponds. If you go away for five years and then come back, don't be surprised that there might be an issue. And then the ebb and flow. A lot of times we'll get banks that have this brown muck, but you want to have a lot of native plants to start growing into it. This is not a pond I maintain, but I wanted to show that like, I would rather look at a lot of green vegetation than that Bacopa can get really nice flowers rather than just mud. There should be plants everywhere. Muddy banks is usually a sign that you don't have enough native plants or enough species diversity. Water hyacinth is pretty. Water hyacinth is nice. Water hyacinth almost gave us 800 hippos and is the reason we made herbicides. Pickerel weed looks almost the same as water hyacinth, except the flowers are a little smaller. You might have to not have the prettiest plant in the world, so we don't have to spend several billion dollars a year maintaining it. Manage your expectations. This is like the mo one of the most beautiful plants in the world, but it's also the most invasive plant in the world. One of these guys can cover six acres in a month of water. One of these plants. And guess what? You think, well, I got in a little pond in my backyard. It's not hurting anyone, right? Birds spread it, gators spread it, turtles spread it, seeds. Little, like you throw it into your compost and maybe one of the roots survived and then it gets washed into a local water body. There's all sorts of ways this stuff can spread. If it's not native, it, sorry, if it's not native, and it's not edible, what are you doing? Why are you making my life hard? Don't fertilize, stop. If, if it's a pot, I can understand it, but try to use compost or other things or just, you know, native plants. And you want to have as many native plants around the edge. You want to have floating water lilies, especially in shallow water, because again, you're either looking at the good plants or you're looking at algae. And this is the number one issue I see, these giant mats of algae. Some of the largest mats I've seen have been over 60 feet wide across an entire pond, and they grow from the bottom up to the surface. So they had a 60 foot wide, eight foot deep band of algae around an entire lake. Nowhere in nature looks like this. This is bad and easily prevented. So now we're gonna go into a little bit of some of the research I do, but first, just so everyone is aware, this probably should have been a little later in the slideshow, but I was messing with it last night. Sorry, it's a three hour drive to get here. I didn't have time to go over this too much. Butterfly gardens and butterfly pollination gardens and any plant garden that you want to attract butterflies to are going to need two distinct plants. Host plants, which is what the caterpillars eat. The monarch and queen butterflies only eat milkweed. If you don't have milkweed, you don't have monarchs. We have 21 different species of milkweed native to the state, and the largest one native to our state is the pink milkweed. It gets two to three times as large as the tropical milkweed that you see in stores and loves to grow on pond edges. The white milkweed, also known as the Florida Swamp or Aquatic Milkweed, can actually grow underwater for several days to weeks at a time. And guess what? When the water levels come up, the caterpillars move up with it and will leave the pond and pupate and then turn into butterflies. There are many, many species of wetland butterfly that time their life cycles around the movement of water. I see most queen butterflies on white aquatic milkweed in swamps, and they time their life cycles in the spring and fall when the water levels are a little less high than the summer. Um, non-native plants generally don't support butterflies. Most caterpillars don't eat them. Um, and non-native plants generally have more pest insects or support pest insects like some of the echo moths or the pus moths, like those moths that just kind of eat anything and like sting. They're generalists. They eat almost anything. Your non-native plants and oleander will not support that. Pollinator plants are actually just as important, and these are what the monarchs eat. Just because it has a flower doesn't mean it is usable by our natives. The reason you don't see a lot of the oak butterflies, even though oaks are everywhere, is those live oak butterflies, the dusky wings, use sunflowers and native asters and blazing stars as their main food source. If you don't have those, you don't have dusky wings. And even, you'll even get butterflies in places you don't expect. Mangroves actually have butterflies. They have the mangrove skipper, these beautiful black and blue butterflies. And the caterpillars are also known as cat face caterpillars because they, they actually have a little cat face and they look outside of these little nests at you. That's adorable. I prefer that over kids. That's way more fun. Kids are a lot of work. So one of the things that we started off our company and why we're different and why we're actually getting this to work is a process called multimodal biological control. This is a pretty straightforward thing that says you use complementary native species to target nuisance species. 
I know this seems like a lot of mumbo jumbo, and, but basically, if you have mosquitoes, we put in mosquito fish, right, to control them? That makes sense, right? Like, it's, there's a reason we do it all over the state, and some scientists were doing a study, and they found that if you had a pond with a bunch of mosquito fish, like 100 mosquito fish, they would eat about 60, 65% of the mosquitoes. That's pretty good, right? Like, that's most of them. It's a D. I went to a school with no grades, so I don't know letter grades, really. That's a new college. Um, but when you would compare it to another fish, a killifish, same number of killifish, 100 killifish, they only ate 40% of the mosquitoes. And you're like, oh, obviously, well, we're using the right fish, right? But when you combine the two and you used 50 of each fish, 50 mosquito fish, 50 killifish, same pond, same number of fish, just two different kinds, the mosquitoes that were eaten were over 85 to 90 percent. The mosquitoes couldn't just change their behavior to dodge one fish. There were multiple predators, multiple controls. And we do this for algae. We have multiple plants filtering out, multiple things shading it out, multiple things eating them. Biological diversity is so important. So many of these species rely on each other. And also, when one species is blooming, another one might be dormant. If you only have one species, you don't have an ecosystem. And many of these species will also encourage more native species to pop up because you'll get more of those birds that are spreading seeds. And sometimes some of those birds will even spread um, fish larvae through various means. This is very important. And in fact, one of the biggest things is do not use copper in your pond. Copper does not break down. Even Roundup, which I also don't recommend using in glyphosate, will eventually break down in the environment. Copper will not. Copper just builds up. And copper is arsenic to anything without a backbone. And if you have too much copper in a retention pond, and you have to then dredge that retention pond, it is classified as hazardous waste. And that quadruples the cost to dredge. That's a financial issue. And copper also can make a lot of insect issues worse. Raise your hand if you like mosquitoes. Yeah. Raise your hand if you love midge flies. Yeah, no, they're important. A lot of things eat them. But the things that eat them, the number one control for mosquitoes is actually not the mosquito fish. They're good at eating them in the water. But the number one control is the dragonfly. They are the dragons of the sky. They fly. Huh. These guys eat mosquitoes not only in the water, but also as adults, they fly around and they chase the mosquitoes. When you use copper in a lake, it kills pretty much all the invertebrates, it kills most of them, and um, a lot of other chemicals can also hurt the invertebrate populations. But mosquitoes, they can completely restart their population and start going again within as little as five to 30 days, depending on the species. Some mosquitoes breed that fast. They'll go from larva to adult in as little as five days. Dragonflies take six months to five years, depending on the species. Copper is usually applied monthly. If you take six months to five years to reproduce, and you're getting killed off every single month, you will eventually not have dragonflies, and you'll have more mosquitoes and midge flies. And those mosquitoes and midge flies like to eat a lot of the gunk on the bottom of the pond that we don't like looking at. We also stock a lot of aquatic herbivores like golden shiners, um, tadpoles. We stock um, many different species of fish, and these just eat algae. We have over 42 different species that we work with. And these species are extremely useful. They are all native except for the grass carp that is sterile, and we use it to eat invasive plants instead of spraying. They found that to spray out all the hydrilla, which is another big invasive aquatic plant, in the 70 largest lakes in Florida would be three to five billion dollars. I could buy one house in Florida for that. <laughs> to do the same thing with grass carp would be 200 million. It's still a lot, but it's way better for the environment and way, way less chemical. Being environmentally friendly is not only the environmental option, but it's the smart financial choice. And we work with a lot of cities, a lot of towns, uh, municipalities, HOAs to do this. This is not only the best way, but the cheapest way. And in fact, NOAA, the Notion National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, released the Living Shorelines Guide that stated that if you're using a living shoreline, it's about $15 a foot to build and half that to maintain it. Riprap is between $250 and $500 to install and maintain. You spend half the cost upfront on maintenance. You might be like, well, you just put it in, it's rock, and it's fine. 
you have to rebuild those every once in a while. And that's way more expensive. You have to take all the other rock out or like rebuild it. That's way more expensive than weeding. Get grandkids to do it. Get, get neighbor to do it. Get, hire a landscaper. Why are we building mountains of stone? And seawalls are the worst. A seawall costs around $1,000 a square foot to install and half that to maintain. I've seen several communities where the seawalls have failed completely and they're losing large chunks of backyard. There's pointed rebar everywhere and it looks like garbage. Don't do that. We're also working on helping to introduce new species into captivity. We have been successful with the bringing the American lotus back into the trade. It used to be more common, um, the guy growing it um, passed on, and so it wasn't in the trade anymore. We helped brought it back. Um, we're, we also do a lot of turtle stalking. Right now there's an FWC ban on stalking native turtles because there's a disease going on, so don't move turtles. If you see a sick one, call FWC. Um, we also have some ongoing projects to look into releasing native bivalves, just like you put oysters and scallops in the ocean. We want to do native bivalves and mussels in our ponds. If there's one thing, you know, we all go to the gym for, it's mussels. Um, golden shiners, lake chub suckers, a lot of these um, ciprinids are, and you know, carp, basically our native versions of carp, are really good at not only eating uh, midge flies and um, insects on the bottom, but they also eat a lot of the junk, the detritus, and they'll eat a lot of algae. So they're kind of like a cleanup crew. And then again, having more of those insect eating fish is very important. They're really good at helping like the um, golden top minnow, they help control mosquitoes. Mosquitoes kill more people than every other animal combined because they carry disease. And I am far more scared of mosquitoes than gators and snakes. You wanna know how many gators I've been bitten by? Zero. You want to know how many snakes have been bitten by or even attacked by in seven years of wetland management? Zero. You want to know how many kids have bitten me on the job? One. Three-year-old right on the ankle terrified me. Again, skids, kids scare me far more than any other animal I see out there. And then my favorite, this little guy. This is one of the number one fish we stock. It is the Florida flagfish. It is native to every single county in Florida and has beautiful red and white stripes and a little blue star, like a little blue spot only found in Florida, because we are that extra of a state. By using these fish, we can help prevent algae blooms. And if we don't have to spray out all the algae blooms in fresh water, that helps clean up all the water going downstream. And if we can clean up all the water downstream, we can help improve water quality there and regrow our sea grasses, our oyster beds, and um, help restore our mangroves and prevent red tide. And what better way to prevent red tide than the American freedom fish? That's cool. And this is cheap. We can save America using native plants and fish. Ah, that's amazing. And here is like some general takeaways when you're doing a lot of your landscaping. Use the right plant, right place, soil, light, and water. And uh, we have a bunch of handouts up front. We have a newsletter where we talk about this. Um, a lot of extension offices and Bay Estuary programs talk about using a lot of um, native aquatics. Um, we generally help use larger, we do larger projects. And if you need help with individual landscaping, um, we work with partners all over the state. I definitely recommend checking out the Florida Native Plant Society or the Florida Association of Native Nurseries to learn where to get some of these plants to do these projects. If it's not native, not edible, and you're not using it for anything, don't plant it. Brazilian pepper was the 1963 landscape plant of the year, and now it is my job security. <laughs> yeah, you all laugh, but I am very sweaty and very tired. Oh. The state of Florida also has statute 373.185. Statute 373.185. That states, if you are using native plants or drought tolerant xeriscaping in your yard, HOAs are not allowed to tell you what to plant. This is the state protecting your right to restore habitat. If an HOA tries to fine you, go against you, or say, yeah, in any way, you can sue them, and they get to pay for your garden. You can make entire HOAs go green with this because not only should native plants be the norm, but you are protected by law for doing this. Native plants should not be the exception, they should be the rule. Flowering plants, a pl plant for every season. I know everyone thinks Florida is green year round, but you know, we have seasons, like plant some seasonal plants. You get more butterflies, you get more stuff. 
I included a lot of really cool stuff like Hammock Sweet Azalea is a really good um, shade loving um, shrub, beautiful flowers. Uh, this is Odie, the river otter. He's one of the orphan otters we work with. And he was otterly adorable. Um, a lot of snakes are actually really good at controlling rats and pests, and most of them aren't poisonous, so I do recommend not killing every snake you see. Um, there are also a lot of native plants that might have local or regional variations. This is actually a pink button bush that we found in Sarasota County. Um, so you'll find new plants and new colors all the time. And by planting more natives, we can help introduce more varieties into the plant trade. You might be able to find them. This is a queen butterfly nectaring on a endangered scrub aster. This is the Florida larger mantis. It's larger than the other Florida mantises because scientists aren't creative. Um, blue curls, excellent drought tolerant um, natives. This is one of the very few photos in existence of the Minnesota pawpaw hybridized with a native other pawpaw. There might only be five of these plants in existence. And then it's called a Simina bethaniensis. Oh yeah, I know Latin, fancy. Um, we also have, oh, these are some of the sundews and the carnivorous plants. Pine lilies are only found in pine habitat. That's a gorgeous lily. That's better than anything you'll find at a flower store. Those flowers get this big. They're only found in pine habitat, and we have less than 2% of our pine habitat left. Put some pines in your yard. And if you are planting an ecosystem that relies on fire, mowing actually does a decent job of mimicking that, except instead of having to mow your yard once or twice a month, native ecosystems usually only mow once, maybe twice a year. And again, I'm lazy. I'm one of those millennials you hear a lot about on the news. I don't want to mow every month or twice a month. Let's mow once a month, or sorry, <laughs> once a year. Um, have different layers, shrubs, trees, different kinds of stuff. One of the reasons we have so little biodiversity is just that flat grass lawn, that just grass turf. There's no habitat, there's nowhere for animals to hide or have nests or reproduce. And also the number one organism that benefits from grass lawns are fire ants. They actually specialize in short grasslands and they're really effective hunters in that short grass. Their prey has nowhere to hide. When you have a grass and like turf only lawn, the only species you're benefiting are chinch bugs and fire ants. And I guess lawnmower companies, I don't know. Um, there are so many other way, things you can replace it with. You could do things like mulch pathways, you could do meadows, you can do edible plants, you could do um, mixed native communities, you can do just native, even, even just native ground covers is so much better. And so a few of the things that we're working on, epiphyte restoration in trees, new natives in captivity, we have yearly projects where we try to get new ones there. I also run the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project, but I don't think this is Sarasota or Manatee County. I, I was asleep for a long drive. We might have done a U-turn at some point, but I think this is a different county. Um, we actually ran out of habitat restoration gifts. We sent them, uh, a lot of them, to Fort Myers to help with the rebuild after Hurricane Ian. Um, one of my big mottos is if you have an invasive species in your yard or a non-native plant in your yard, I'm not telling you to rip every single thing out of your yard immediately and completely replace everything, but whenever you go to get new plants, is it native? Is it edible? Whenever your tree dies or something and you replace it, use something native. We also have a monthly newsletter. You can sign up either outside or online. We don't spam it. It's like once a month or every other month. It's got lots of cute animal pictures and we talk about cool stuff. And we have to write it ourselves, so we're like, I don't have time for spam mail, so don't worry. Um, we have contact information. That's our website, our phone. And thanks for listening. Let's get planting. And then, since I have a little bit of time left, at the end of this presentation, which I'll have up online, there are hundreds of different examples of all these different native plants you can use. Many of them are common in the plant trade, and how you use them, where you use them, um, new ways to get them. And again, this is that picker weed, the water hyacinth replacement. It gets pretty big purple cones of flowers. That, one of the largest native plant flowers to the North America, hi scarlet hibiscus, Hundreds of different butterflies and insects use it. Pylon hibiscus, more of a northern species. Swamp rose mallow, button bush, bald cypress, and the list goes on. We have so many different varieties of native plants you can use. And my company has been proud to restore so many. And I have one final thing to say before I go. As some of you might have heard from the news and from the beginning of this presentation, I am a new College of Florida alumni. And 
New College of Florida has been in the news quite a bit. Um, they have recently put in a new board, which is fine. I mean, New College has always had some issues and, you know, boards change. Um, and that is the right. But there are two issues. One is they're trying to fundamentally change the academic program that has led to all the success. And many of the students and faculty do not want that. New College has always been a diverse place of ideas and academia. And they are trying to make it specifically one very extreme specific viewpoint. And the person they have hired to do this is named Christopher Rufo. He is well known for starting a lot of inflammatory wars and violent hate speech. He has been cited in several mass shooter manifestos, including his specific rhetoric. And I am worried that he will affect the people at New College. Many of the people who have helped do these projects to restore many plants and animals to the environment. So I would like to ask you all to please stand with the faculty, the students, and the alumni of New College. Because if you want to support native plants, habitat restoration, I have three full-time staff, 12 contractors, and hundreds of people, volunteers, and people working to make this possible. Half of them are from New College. This doesn't happen without New College. If you like native plants, if you want to keep Florida green, if you want to protect our waterways, then I ask you to please stand with New College. Thank you. And we'll take uh, one question, if you want. Anybody got a question? Oh, that's right. Thank you, but I'm not afraid of politics. I look great in khaki, so I don't mind being on the limelight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You've given us some really practical information on what we can do in our own yards, in our own ponds.